All right, today is lecture seven. All right. The uh, topics for today, lecture A, we're going to talk more about parametric curves and vectors. So again, the content about parametric curves is back in chapter four. The content about, about vectors is in the appendix, appendix D. I want to talk about these things because they're important. They're important to know, I think, both in calculus two and for physics if you take physics and in <coughs> multivariable calculus if you take that. And in, in differential equations as well. Those, those three classes I think are definitely worth doing vectors in calc two with, even though it's not a main the main part of the Related to that, related to integrals, we'll be ultimately calculating the distance traveled based on the speed and see what kind of intervals that we get. We'll get some kind of tricky intervals. You're going to have a mathematical homework, um, more than one actually, a few mathematical homeworks based on these videos that I'm having you watch. So I had you watch before today, ideally, I think it was six videos. Uh, there's going to be six more videos to watch before Friday, uh, and a mathematical homework to work on. I'm going to show you that homework in class here today and basically, basically tell you what to do. Um, Maybe we can even go through that somewhat in lecture A here. Then we're going to be talking about a, a method called integration by trigonometric substitution, which is a little trickier than ordinary substitution. Again, we'll have a quiz mid-class, and this quiz will be more about integration by parts. Our gateway exam is next Friday. Today is Wednesday, September 14, 2016, next Friday. <coughs> the 23rd of September 2016, after lecture 11, which will then be shorter, you'll have the gateway exam, you'll have a half hour for the gateway exam. There will be six integrals to do, you have to get five out of six exactly right with no partial credit to pass. Again, in the past, about 50% of the people passed the gateway in the first try, but it can be higher for you if you practice real hard, you work on studying the integrals, and try to remember how to do them, and I try to remember how to not make mistakes in, in certain kinds of common mistakes, then you can do it. The trick, just a second, the trigonometric substitutions we do today are hard enough that they're actually not in the gateway, but we're going to talk about another method on Friday called partial fractions, which will be in the gateway. So the, uh, the integrals in the back of the book, in the table, will those be included in the gateway? Uh, no. But you won't have to do those except for the memorized ones, numbers one through seven. Okay. Okay. So you should memorize one through seven in that table, which were the, the things I told you to memorize that I think it was the second day of class. Okay. Um, so again, I'll give you a half hour of the gateway. You can retake it, take it if you don't pass it, but it is a different version. It's not exactly the same questions. I have told you how to do all the kinds of problems that are on the gateway so far, except for some partial fraction ones. We'll start talking about that on Friday. All right, what about these parametric curves? Well, first of all, before we get into it, I want to show you that parametric curves are certainly important. I did discuss them briefly on Monday before you took the mini exam, um, or was, was the day before last Friday. I talked about them as modeling motion. Parametric curves are ideal for modeling motion. X is a function of time and Y is a function of time. You get a point moving around the plane. I think the example we did last time, or Friday, was uh, X was equal to T and Y was equal to T to the three halves. And we found a formula for the distance traveled. Here's an example where parametric curves are useful in describing planetary motion. All this Mathematica code is something that I made to um, show the orbits of Neptune and Pluto, which I still think of as a planet, even though it's now only, what do they call it, a protoplanet? Dwarf planet, something like that. Pluto is no longer an official planet. It's now a dwarf planet. Did you know it's not always further away from the sun than Neptune is? Sometimes Neptune is further away. Every once, every something, like every 200 years or something like that. Here I'm pretending they're on the same line through the uh, through this x-axis here. That dot represents both Neptune and Pluto. But as time goes by, 
Let me slow it down here. Pluto's orbit in red there is more eccentric than Neptune's. Neptune's looks like a circle. It's actually not exactly a circle. It's an ellipse. The red one, Pluto's, is definitely more elliptical. In both cases, the sun is without what's called a focus of the ellipse. And this is modeling how they move. And yeah, every once in a while, Pluto's orbit comes inside of Neptune's orbit. But I should say, I should add, they don't necessarily, when that happens, they're necessarily at the same spot at the same time, even though it seems like it. Okay? They aren't even on the same axis through the sun. It's just that Nep uh, Pluto, Pluto's orbit does go inside Neptune's orbit. The red orbit does go barely inside the blue orbit. And Pluto comes closer to the sun than that. Um, these are described in parametric curves. This is motion in both cases. As time goes by, Neptune and Pluto go around the sun. Their x and y coordinates are functions of time. I also have these red and blue vectors in there, arrows. Arrows are vectors. Those are called position vectors for the planets. The red vector, the red arrow for the orbit of Pluto, the position of Pluto. The blue vector for the position of Neptune. They point from the sun to the planet at any given moment in time. Arrows are vectors. Those are called directed quantities. And in this case, again, they are called position vectors. They specify how far the planet is from the sun and in what direction. It's very natural to combine the study of parametric curves and vectors, okay? It's also going to be useful for us, by the way, at the end of the semester when we do some things with differential equations. These ideas will come back. So let's consider another example. <coughs> so I'll be talking about parametric curves and vectors, but I'm going to move this down so I have blank space here. Let's consider a simple looking example. x equals t, y equals t squared. Those are called parametric equations. This is called a system of parametric equations. Those two equations, that one system, is often thought of as what you might call a point equation or vector equation, it will turn out. x and y both depend on time, and the point x, y depends on time. The point x, y, its coordinates depend on y, on t, in that way. I told you last time that to find the speed of motion, it's more than just a curve, it's a speed, you need to calculate as a function of t, the square root of the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of y squared. That actually turns out to be the length of something called the velocity vector, of the point which we will talk about here today. But for the moment, this is just the way you calculate the speed. It's not going to, in general, be a constant function. This changes. You calculate these derivatives. x prime is 1. y prime is 2t. This function right here gives you the speed of the object described by these parametric equations as it moves. And it's not constant. If you graph the speed versus time, <coughs> you get a function that I think will look about like that. Kind of like a parabola. It's technically not a parabola. In fact, it looks more and more straight as you go on and parabola and through that. That's the speed as a function of time as the graph of that function. Just again, like one dimensional motion, the distance traveled is the integral of the speed. I'm just telling you that. I did argue for why that was true. I think it was last Friday when we were talking about Riemann sums, approximating the area with Riemann sum, and the idea that that would also approximate the distance traveled graph the speed. That was an intuitive argument for why the distance traveled 
is the integral of the speed. Once again, I could write an indefinite integral and put a plus c involved and say, okay, maybe if I take distance traveled at time zero to be zero, which you would want to do typically, maybe the c will be zero, but maybe it could be something else. I do want a function whose graph goes to the origin. It's going to be better for us in general, though, to write this as a definite integral. An integral from time zero to time t, make that upper limit of integration a variable. So that second fundamental theorem of calculus will be relevant here. Integrate the speed. Use a different letter besides t here and here. I use tau. Free version of t, you could use u if you prefer w. <coughs> And in this example, here would be the integral that we have to do. <coughs> okay, this time I'm going to solve this definite integral in a way that I told you not to do it before. Okay? When we were talking about substitution, I said I want you to do the substitution and change the limits of integration. Okay? I could do that here. But for the purposes of emphasizing that part of the homework is going to be calculating indefinite integrals like this, I'm going to do the indefinite integral with the substitution first before I go back to t and or to tau and plug in these limits of integration. And I think, for the sake of avoiding using taus, I guess, I need to do it without a tau. I'll use some other way. Okay, so come over here. I think I'll use x. I'm going to do this indefinite integral. The integral of square root 1 plus 4x squared dx. If you try integration by parts, which you could try, you could try letting u be the square. Well, okay, u, prime, u being 1 and d prime being the square root of 1 plus 4x squared. But if you did that, to find d, you'd have to do the same problem as we're trying to do. If you let uh, u be at square root and d prime be 1, that might be helpful. But if you let u be the square root, u prime would also involve the square root. <coughs> and it's, it's not real helpful. If you try a substitution, letting w equal 1 plus 4x squared, dw would be 8x dx, which is not in here. Maybe you could solve for x in the equation w equals 1 plus 4x squared, and maybe that would help. But it turns out to be best to, instead of using an ordinary substitution like that, to use a, a trigonometric substitution. And the, the reason why these trigonometric substitutions are helpful is because of trigonometric identities. The most important of which being cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. And from that, you can also divide everything by cos squared theta to say 1 plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta. You get from here to here, just divide everything by cos squared theta. This is true no matter what theta is. This is true no matter what theta is as long as it's in the domain. You don't want to divide by zero. Tangent and secant are actually both undefined, <coughs> for example, at theta equals pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2, and 5 pi over 2, and 7 pi over 2. Those things are undefined at those values of theta in radians. But all other values of theta, except for those where you're either at the top or the bottom of the given circle, this is true for. It's these facts that are going to make these trigonometric substitutions useful. When you've got a plus sign in here, 1 plus 4x squared, it's going to turn out to be best um, to use the second equation, actually. This is a little tricky here. To think of this integral like this, and to look at this expression, 1, which is the same as 1 squared, plus 2x quantity squared, and say to yourself, hmm, that's, if, if 
tangent of theta were a 2x, that would match what I see over here. Did you catch that? Look at, look at this thing here. 1 or 1 squared plus 2x quantity squared. This one could be thought of as being squared as well. I mean, I don't have to do it that way because 1 squared is 1. But if you wanted to, you could think of it as 1 squared plus tan squared equals secant squared. If I let the 2x be a tangent theta, then I guess this thing under the square root would be a secant squared theta. And that is the substitution we would do. Let 2x equal tangent theta. Whenever you have something squared plus something else that can be thought of as a square, 4x squared can be thought of as 2x squared. It turns out to be a good idea to try this kind of substitution. Whatever expression involves the variable that's being squared, let that be tangent theta. Theta is now my new variable. Just like in the other kind of substitution, w or u was the new variable. Now theta is going to be a new variable. It's a little different than the old other way of doing it. With the other kind of substitution, you would say let w equal something involving x. Here we're saying let x, or 2x in this case, in, involves um, equal something involving theta. So it's a little bit backwards that way, but it will still work. Differentiate both sides. dx d theta, if I divide both sides by 2, would be 1 half secant squared theta. I could keep the 2 on the left if I like instead, and just have a dx on the left, and differentiate the right side and have a d theta over there. That kind of equation is equivalent to saying dx d theta is one half secant squared theta. You can do that as an intermediate step, but if you don't need to do that as, a, as an intermediate step, you can just go from this one step to there. So what happens if I use the substitution? The 2x gets replaced with tangent theta, so I get a tangent squared theta. <coughs> And the dx gets replaced with, I guess I should divide both sides by 2 here, 1 half secant squared theta d theta. Okay. It's a little strange again in a couple ways that I've got my new variable on the right side instead of the left. In this case, I let the 2x equal that tangent theta because of the fact that it was the 2x being squared here. That turns out to be the best thing to do. If it were just an x squared, then I'd let x equal tangent theta. But it's a 2x quantity squared, so I let 2x be tangent theta. And we'll see that this works out. Though it's not an easy integral to do still. Technically speaking, I am also assuming uh, that theta is in the range of values where this function is invertible, tangent theta, which is. Um, in the first and fourth quadrants where theta goes between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. I'm going to go ahead and write that. You don't have to write it. It will be important in recognizing a few things as we keep going here to emphasize we're in the range of values for the theta where the tangent is invertible, where the arc tangent or inverse tangent uh, can be solved for. In fact, I could do that right away. I could say because of these two things, I could solve that equation for theta to say theta is the arc tangent of 2x, or inverse tangent if you prefer to the same thing. But now I use that trig identity that I circled over there. 1 plus tangent squared theta. That's the same as secant squared theta. What's the square root of x squared? Is it x? Well, technically not, actually. It's the absolute value of x. Because right? if x is negative, like negative 5, 
negative 5 squared is positive 25. By definition, the square root symbol means take the positive square root. You get 5. Ne the square root of negative 5 squared is positive 5. So to make them equal for all x, you need an absolute value sign. So technically speaking, I'm taking the square root of secant squared theta here. Technically, that's the absolute value of the secant theta. However, since I said let theta be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, that's actually positive. You don't need the absolute value. Secant theta is 1 over cos theta. Cos theta is, a, is positive in the first and fourth quadrants. Secant is positive over there, too. I don't need the opposite value signs. This will become the integral of secant cubed theta. And don't forget the 1 half, like I almost forgot. That looks a little bit better. Can you see it? Um, I'm, I'm just. All right, I think I figured this out now. Can you see where you're sitting, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because when you take the square root of secant squared, you get secant theta. Yeah, you get the, like I said, you get the absolute value of secant, but we are in the range of values for theta where secant is positive, so we can get rid of the absolute value signs. And have secant theta times secant squared theta is secant cubed theta. <coughs> looks a little bit better than that does, at least. It's still not a real easy integral to do, okay? The best way to do this is with now with integration by parts. But even when we use integration by parts, we're going to have to use a trick to help us finish it. This trick is one of my favorite tricks in all of math, though. It's just amazing that it works out. Anyway, first let's use integration by parts. Turns out to be best since... Um, since it's easy to find the antiderivative of secant squared, to let v prime be secant squared theta and u be secant theta. Right? This could be a gateway problem. Integrate secant squared. Should go just like that. That's a memorized one. What is it? Tangent theta. You don't need a plus c here. U prime, what's the derivative of secant theta? What's the derivative of secant theta? Secant theta times tangent theta. So according to the integration by parts formula, we're going to get 1 half u times v is secant theta tangent theta minus 1 half times the integral of v times u prime tangent squared theta times secant theta. Yeah, this doesn't seem better. It seems worse, doesn't it? Once again, trigonometric identities come to the rescue. Tangent squared theta is, by this equation, secant squared theta minus 1. This is secant squared theta minus 1. When I multiply that by secant theta, I'm going to get a secant cubed and a secant. Maybe I can do that trick of solving for the integral I want to know. Because I'll have an integral of secant cubed. So let's see here. One half secant theta, tangent <coughs> theta. Minus one half times the integral of secant cubed theta plus one half times the integral of secant theta. And now, yeah, I can add this to both sides of the fact that this equals that to solve for the integral of secant cubed. Although, I ultimately want to divide that by 2 because I want to solve for one half the integral of secant cubed. Because that's what we're doing. If I add one half times the integral of secant cubed to both sides, it'll cancel on the right, it'll, it'll equal just the integral of secant cubed on the left. So the integral of secant cubed is really one half secant theta tangent theta plus one half the integral of secant theta but I do want ultimately to know one half the integral of secant cubed. So I should really get one fourth secant theta 
plus one fourth integral secant bit. Mm -hmm. Why do we keep having those one halves in front of the uh, integrals? Because there was a one half here. And that one half came from the one half here, which came from the fact that it was x, 2x that would equal theta back here. Okay. There was so 2 dx was secant squared. Wouldn't that one half only be in front of the first since we took it out of the integral? It's Okay, it comes first of all from here. dx yeah. is going to be 1 half secant squared theta d theta. So there's where that 1 half comes from. Yeah. I took it out of the integral, but now I'm keeping it down here because it's, it's right there. So I'm we saying keep... that 1 half times this integral equals all of this. Okay, yeah, but why is there... <coughs> so I don't know if I'm having a complete brain fart right now, but if we have the 1 half out, mm -hmm. then it would only be the 1 half secant tangent theta minus the integral of secant of tangent squared theta, secant theta. Why do we have that second one half? These one halves have to go in both spots. I, I, I'm saying one half times this integral equals all of this. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it is funny. Now if I add this to both sides, then the one half on the left goes away. But I'm ultimately wanting one half times the integral, so I'm going to divide my answer by two. Okay. So ultimately, what this means you see it down here? Is the integral that I want, 1 half secant cubed theta, you see that? Is 1 fourth secant theta tangent theta um, plus 1 fourth integral of secant theta. That's the integral I want. It's better. Now I'm down to an integral of secant theta. Better than integral of secant cubed, isn't it? It seems so. However, if you sit here and kind of scratch your head for a while, you realize it's not clear how to do that integral at all. If only it were an integral of secant squared, then it would be easy. It would be tangent. But it's just a secant. This is now where you use what is one of my favorite tricks in all of math. Because Whoever thought of this should have gotten a PhD just for thinking of it. Okay? You know mathematicians like to use the trick of adding zero in a convenient way? Maybe you add zero by subtracting five and adding five. Sometimes you have to do that when you complete the square, for example. Or multiplying by one in a convenient way. You know, when you rationalize the denominator, for example, 1 over square root of 2, multiply by 1 in a convenient way, that rationalizes the denominator. By the way, is it illegal to have something answer like this? Is it mathematically illegal? No, it's okay. Square roots and denominators are okay. So why does your 8th grade teacher tell you rationalize the denominator? Well, partially it makes the answers easier to check. And partially because it's just a useful technique to solve some other kinds of problems. That's why. That's not illegal. It's not like dividing by zero. Okay? Okay, the trick here is going to be to multiply by one in a, in a convenient way. The convenient way, again, whoever guessed this, just amazing. So it's the most disguised form of one you would ever guess in a problem. You multiply by secant theta plus tangent theta divided by secant theta plus tangent theta. What? Doesn't that make it infinitely worse? No. Well, not infinitely worse. It's actually better. What? Why is it better? Maybe if I multiply the secant through the top, maybe that will help. And maybe if I rearrange the bottom in the opposite order, maybe that will help. You see how this is actually an easy angle to do? Oh, this is taking a while, isn't it? Almost a quiz time. It's actually an easy angle to do. Do a substitution. W is tan theta plus secant theta. And DW is sitting right there for you. 
dw is secant squared theta plus secant theta tangent theta d theta. It's sitting in there for you. You're really integrating 1 over w. You get natural log of the absolute value of w. You can do it. It's natural log of the absolute value of w, which is tangent theta plus secant theta. Oh, this is taking so long. We're not really getting the parametric curve so well here. Oh, in fact, I guess we're going to have to go over into lecture B. And we're not even done, right? We need to get the, get the answer in terms of x. Use that. Use this. I think we better try to finish it before the quiz. How? Okay. Um, so, where are we here? So the integral we want is, and it's down here that we got to look again. One fourth secant theta, tangent theta, plus one fourth times the answer we just found. Natural log of the absolute value of secant theta, or tangent theta plus secant theta, doesn't matter. Okay. Plus c. But now we need to get back in terms of x using the fact that theta is the inverse tangent of 2x. It's helpful to draw a right triangle here now and label one of the non-right angles as theta equals arctangent of 2x. Since the tangent of an angle in a right triangle like that is opposite of or adjacent, and we know the tangent of this angle is 2x, we can take the opposite side to be 2x and the uh, adjacent side would be 1 if we want. We could also use 4x and 2 or 6x and 3. Might as well use 2x and 1. By the Pythagorean theorem, the length of the hypotenuse is square root of 1 plus 4x squared. Hmm, that looks familiar. The tangent of this angle is just 2x tangent of the arctangent of 2x. What's the secant of the angle? Secant is 1 over cosine. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosecant is hypotenuse over adjacent. I guess that's just the square root of 1 plus 4x squared over 1, which is square root of 1 plus 4x squared. So to finish the problem now, I won't take the time to write it. Replace the secant theta that you see in here, right there and right there, with that. And replace the tangent theta that you see here and here with that. I will write it up on the board while you take the quiz. I'm going to look at it after you're done with the quiz.